everyone and we are live i'm with preeti today how are you preeti i'm good how are you i am well i'm well so thank you uh once again for joining me today and as i was just mentioning to you earlier um i'm really fascinated with you know well there's obviously a lot of fascinating people in our industry but i'm more fascinated in their stories and kind of like what brought them here and and their world view and 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 you're you know you're someone who's been in the space for some time and and really wanted to you know capture that but before i did um the first thing i usually start with is like where did we meet or how do we meet it's probably through twitter or i'm trying to think was it at one of like bruce's events i think we may be cross i think right? it was one of those events yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay cool so so where i guess where does your story begin you know some people start with their first job some people start with their parents meeting i mean it's uh, <laughs> up to you <laughs> um i guess yeah it's it's a tough question i mean i can start with my career in tech i guess um oh. i uh so i i used to live in california i mean sorry i used to live in new jersey but before that i kind of lived all over the world but i came to california to go to college at usc i was an industrial engineer and uh, I loved engineering, I loved math, I loved science, and I thought I wanted to be an engineer for the rest of my life. And, um, but I was also very much into like understanding people and business. And so I decided to minor in business and lo and behold, through that, I, I kind of fell into the finance crowd. Mm -hmm. And that's how um, I sort of got into learning about finance, what finance was. And as an engineer, honestly, a lot of it didn't make sense to me at the time. But what I liked about it was the energy. So when you're an engineer, I think you're, you know, you hang out with mostly nerds and uh, it's it's not as high energy as finance. And so when I fell into that finance crowd in school, mm. I really liked that energy. So I pursued it a little bit more. I started to take a lot of finance classes and then I fell into the investment banking crowd. And eventually two years later, I ended up getting an internship at Goldman Sachs. Um, probably one of the first people at USC to do that, second person at USC to do that. So cool. it was like really, it was really interesting because, you know, I was an hmm. engineering major, but I got like a Goldman Sachs offer. And so that's how I got into, I guess, finance. And that's also how I got to Silicon Valley because I got, um, I was working at the TMT group in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. We were just, we were only six analysts and, you know, pretty competitive team. And so we were working long hours and stuff. Um, and I realized then that I really love tech, but I soon realized that I didn't want to be a banker. And so I wanted to stay in tech, but I didn't want to be a banker. So when I left Goldman, I was like trying to figure out what I want to do. I was, you know, 23 years old, um, and in the Valley and there's, the options are infinite at that point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, especially at that time, it was like 2013 mm -hmm. and, um, I had a few friends that said, you know, try like private equity or, or um, in, uh, venture capital. I had no idea, honestly, what these things even were. Mm. Um, and I was like, all right, let, let me look into both. And so I interviewed about, at a bunch of private equity firms, mm -hmm. um, pretty quickly realized that I didn't want to do that because it was basically like banking 2.0. Mm. And uh, I was like, this is kind of what I'm trying to leave. And then I, I, got a couple of emails from venture capitalists and I honestly just cold emailed a couple of them and uh, two people answered. One was a, a partner at DFJ and another one was a, a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. And we just met for coffee um, a couple months later because VCs are busy and they didn't really want to give you know, a fresh college grad their time. Um, and long story short, I ended up uh, turning that coffee meeting into an offer at Andreessen Horowitz. And so a couple of months later, after that initial call meeting, I got an offer to join um, the deal team at A16Z, which was a really big thing for me because, um, you know, A16Z is well known in the industry. And uh, that really kind of set, uh, it was my first stepping stone into, into the valley, into tech, into crypto, into everything. Um, and I came into A16Z, honestly, knowing very little about startups, knowing very little about like how to even analyze startups, how to think about startups, how, what, I didn't even know what crypto was at the time. This was around 2013, 2014. And, but I joined, you know, I, I had an amazing run there, loved my time, got to work with people like Mark Andreessen and Chris Dixon and just soak up all the knowledge that I could. Um, and then Balaji joined um, right around the time, time that I joined A16Z as he was a 
general partner. And he was the one that encouraged me to read the Bitcoin white paper. So I read it and honestly didn't really understand it at all. Mm. And I was like, this, is, this doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why people would be obsessed with this. Okay, okay. Kind, of, kind of put it down. Um, and then we made the investment in Coinbase and I kind of watched from the sidelines. I wasn't mm. working on the deal myself, but I, I used to work very closely with Chris Dixon and he was working on the deal. So I was kind of trying to understand like why we're doing the Coinbase deal. Still, it didn't really fully click for me, um, if I to be totally honest. And then um, I kind of, you know, went out. I, 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 so I knew a little bit about crypto. I knew there was a lot of hype around it around that time, but I wasn't like, I, I didn't know why. I didn't fully get it yet. And then I eventually decided to leave A16Z after I was there for two years because I wanted to teach myself how to code because I felt like that was one thing that I was missing as an engineer or anyone in the Valley. Um, especially because I wanted to eventually start my own company and I felt like not knowing how to code would kind of suck if I had to rely on someone else like a CTO that where I don't understand the product or the technology. So I left to teach myself how to code. Again, I was still not in crypto at this time, kind of, you know, pursued my coding career and I taught myself how to code. Then um, serendipitously, my, my, the, 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 the opportunity that I took up after learning how to code, I got a few different offers at different tech companies to be a software engineer, one of them being Coinbase. And I remember you know, ta- asking Chris Dixon, which company should I choose from the different offers? And I ended up choosing Coinbase because we both thought that crypto is, is, is where the future is at. And um, I figured it'd be a good opportunity to learn about crypto, to understand like what all the hype was about and also be an engineer at the same time. So I kind of get both in one one deal. So I joined Coinbase as a software engineer. I was probably the second female software engineer there. And um, it was amazing. Like I loved Coinbase. Coinbase, you know, had, at least at the time, this was 2015, um, it would still had the early employees, like the first cohort of employees there. So I was like employee, like less than hundred um, when I joined. Right now they're like 500 and um, I got to work with people like even Fred was still a co-founder at the time. Brian was, you know, very hands-on with the company at the time. We were only like one floor. I think right now they have like multiple floors in the office. So it was a very, it was a very cool time to be there because a lot of them, you know, quirky people, early day, quirky people of crypto, the, the people who'd come into crypto in the early days were there at Coinbase. And so I got to understand them and understand why they're, why crypto matters to them. And I started to form my own thesis about crypto and why I started to fall in love with it. And so, yeah, that was my foray into crypto. And I was there for a while and then decided eventually that I'm ready to finally leave and do my own thing. And that's when I left in 2017, um, right before the whole 2017 hype cycle. And I spent a bunch of months, honestly, just learning about Ethereum because that's when Ethereum was really blowing up, um, learning smart contract development, um, contracting with a couple companies and projects, they were doing ICOs. Um, some of them, you know, like didn't really work out. They were like, yeah, some of them honestly were just like um, a mess. Uh, and I didn't like when you're when when 2017 was happening. It's like it's like hard to even explain in words like what the hell everyone was thinking. Like we all were just so excited, and there was just so much hype, and it was really really impossible to know what was like hype versus not. And um, it was, it was a fun time. So I spent a lot of that year just, uh, just, um, uh, exploring and then eventually decided to start my own company in the end of 2017, which was true story. And we raised funding. We spent two years working on that company. Essentially, we were trying to use crypto as a way to incentivize people to have, um, productive debate online. And so ha- by creating like disincentives for trolling or attacking, we thought we can somehow evolve the conversation, the type of conversation that we can have online. Mm. And I still believe that that's fundamentally a good idea. Um, I just believe that we were too early. I think a lot of the things that we needed to build were not there. And we were having to build everything from ground up. And we honestly, like my interest is more in the consumer facing application side. And but instead, we had to build not only, we had to build the entire blockchain stack. We had to figure out how to take that token public. Um, there was so much tooling that was missing. Scaling the app was like really hard. 
we just felt like a lot of, and then also like the consumer mindset of using a crypto application of using like assigning a keys and completing transactions for each interaction. Like those things were not, people weren't bought into that yet. And I felt like something like this still needs another, another, like a lot of infrastructure to be built so that a user doesn't even understand that they're using a crypto app. And so eventually we decided to shut the company down in January of, of this year. And so, yeah, ever since then, I've been kind of a favorite. Wow. That is like probably the most, uh, one of the most interesting, uh, you know, stories I've heard. Um, there's so much there. And so just to wrap up though, I mean, or wrap up kind of the, the, the main key highlights. So you said you were at Goldman, um, which must have been interesting, right? To go from there to like A16Z, which is like one of the like most prestigious, if not one of, if not the kind of prestigious firm like uh, that makes investments. And, and they've invested in what, I know Coinbase is one, but there's been a whole bunch of really big ones coming out of there, right? Yeah, I mean, they've uh, they've invested in a lot of big ones i mean they were investors in twitter they were invest in in terms mm. of crypto specifically or just tech yeah yeah well i mean just generally so twitter Literally, was the yeah. other one that... twitter lyft um they didn't do uber they missed i think they missed that one they were in oculus they were yeah there's a lot and there coinbase is. um coinbase. you know really the heart of kind of you know the i mean the crypto movement is is Coinbase, yeah. and I'm sure many would argue it, but but is kind of you know really ground zero in many ways, and and what Brian's done for the industry is um, unparalleled. Um, and now with all the recent news with Coinbase, it's just really really exciting. Um, but I, I have got one question. So, what was your relationship with kind of like Bitcoin throughout the arc of this story? In the sense that it sounded like earlier on, it was more just like why would people even be interested? But as kind of things were like you were getting. You know, you were actually programming, working within kind of the belly of the beast, if you will, and you were yeah. actually seeing it from like the investor angle, seeing it from the yeah. startup angle. Like, were you were there were there certain like fundamental hypotheses that you or thoughts that you had that you were kind of like, oh wait, I was maybe totally off base on that, or yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, I think everyone has a different entry point into crypto because crypto is so multi-dimensional. Um, and, you know, it's like some people come at it from like a, a monetary um, point of view because they've worked at banks or the traditional banking system and they understand like all the flaws and they think Bitcoin's a way to fix those. And some people come at it from a philosophical point of view. Some people come at it from, I don't know, a legal point of view because, you know, they like contract law or something. You know, everyone kind of has different entry points that I, I, I've noticed and there's no one singular reason why people come into Bitcoin. Um, but for me, I think like it, it was more, honestly, it didn't really have to, like the one angle was the technology. I thought the technology was, you know, I read the white paper front to back many, many times and um, one of the things I love doing is understanding how things work. And this is one of the reasons I love writing because it allows me to really um, un like take apart a system and understand how it works and then explain it in simple terms. And for me, when I read Bitcoin, it, you know, it just like, it was like intellectually very stimulating to me. I was like, wow, this is like, this is so cool. Like the, 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 the system that works. And it's like, you know, when you read the paper and you're like, it, it's one of those things that just makes so much sense. And like, there's one in one in a lifetime thing, like not many things come across to you that like make that much sense. And so like, that was one thing from a technological point of view is very stimulating. But more importantly, I think what really um, got me was, you know, I think a lot of people that come into crypto are very like, they're not like part of the mainstream crowd. They're different in some way. They're re rebels in some way, I would say. They're not like, um, they're not part of the, you know, the bell curve, they're not in the middle, they're kind of <laughs> at the edges. Mm. And I'm, I would argue I'm one of them. And something about it just felt like it was creating something alternative to what is like to the common, the system. And to me, that kind of rebellious nature of Bitcoin, the energy that, that was there was initially also what really attracted me. Um, and then, and then as I got dug deeper and deeper, like you started to fall more and more and more in love with Bitcoin and crypto. So I think like, again, like I said, everyone has a different entry point, but then you learn about it and then everyone kind of converges on similar reasons for why they're into it. And the more you learn about it, the more it starts to make sense to you. So over the course of like the next, like two years from 2015 to 2017, 
I just kept reading and reading and reading and reading like most people do in crypto. And then the more you read, the more you're like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. And then all these like light bulbs go off and and it was it's it's a fun time when you're first getting into crypto. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say is my in engineering, my favorite class, believe it or not, was English. <clears throat> that was I, I I also I agree with you that I think writing is a very powerful tool. I wouldn't consider myself a great writer, uh, although I've been reading a lot about writing, <laughs> if that makes any sense lately. Like I've been trying yeah. to dissect the art of it and and it is fascinating, right? But, and, and I, by the way, I've read some of your pieces uh, back in the day. I think you wrote some things. Uh, was it about Ethereum and smart contracts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, you, have you ever done anything on the Bitcoin white paper? I, so I wanted to. Um, that would be so I wasn't, good. <laughs> I wasn't sure if, um, I'm actually writing a crypto course right now. So I'll, I'm going to do that hmm. eventually. Hmm. It's a long crypto course. It's going to, it's taking me probably close to six months to actually produce it. But um, right now, I'm still kind of going through the history of the current modern banking system because I do think a lot of people don't understand that. And it's mm. super important to understand that for you to understand why crypto could or could not help um, fix some of the, these things. But yeah, and once I finish the history, um, the next part is actually taking the white paper and dissecting it and actually explaining um, piece by piece how everything works. Yeah, and then and then and then, and then like just this topic of writing. I'm really curious. What what's been your your journey there? Has it just something you've always been gravitating towards, or has it been more like a recent uh, love? Or yeah, just curious? Um, like when I was young, I I mean I remember even in high school I hated writing. I, I mm. when SATs, you know, you have to write that essay. It was like my least favorite thing to do. Um, I don't think I realized how good I was at communicating through writing until my time at A16C when I had to write like, you know, investment memos and people really, really enjoyed them. And I started to realize that like, you know, I have this ability to communicate and I'm a very, I'm an introvert, so I don't really talk much, but I do, but I realize that the way I communicate best is through writing it. That's where I'm much more clear. Um, even verbally, I'm not like, the best there's a lot of people that are better speakers than me but um writing wise like i can really get my thoughts clear on paper and just like see my thoughts there and organize it and then so i started to notice that i was good at writing then and then you know when i started to learn how to code i had to somehow like like I'm, i was learning to code when i was 24 and you know i was kind of late to the game so i was like how do i like jump start my career into this so that like um, I can catch up to some of the people who are, you know, junior or mid-level engineers. And um, the best advice I heard was write, because write, writing allows you to get discovered and you can get discovered by other engineers and then slowly build your career up that way. So honestly, I just started writing. Like I was a complete newbie. I, you know, I was learning code and writing about code at the same time. And, and surprisingly, like, I, Honestly, that one or two years of writing, I met like basically every top engineer in the valley, um, you know, including Brendan Ike, like started retweeting my stuff, which I thought Crazy. was like really cool. Hmm. So that's when I realized like, you know, there's something there. I have this like I have this skill of writing and not many people have it. So that's when I decided to really just like hone in on that and make that my thing. Yeah, I, I actually my um, the interview that will probably like one or two before this one that will come out is this. I just interviewed this lady named Nako, who's uh, she's this lady who uh, helps companies like Casa and Lightning Labs recruit engineers. And I kid you not, she said, I actually was asking her like, what kind of things do you look for? She's like, engine coders that can write well, like sign me yeah. up because like that, that's like so hard to find. And he's like, she's like, when I find someone like that, um, you know, I, I know they're, they're a keeper or whatever. So I was like, okay, that's cool. Hey, I was gonna ask you, and she also mentioned this as well, is, is that, did you, did you notice like a connection between those two worlds, like coding and writing? Because like Nako was talking about like how there seems to be this, like, like coding is writing, I guess, like it's in another language, but, or was it like two different worlds for you? Cause like, for me, it was more like two different worlds, but as I think more about it, I can see how there are parallels. Like she was saying, good writers tend to be good coders and vice versa. But did you see that, that connection? It depends on what type of writer you're talking about. Um, I, when I was, when I first started my writing, career I was my writing was very like analytical technical um, in the sense that I was explaining technical things and I think um, I have I had to the way I wrote was very much like like I said taking apart a system and then putting it back together through writing and if you look at writing in that lens of trying to 
um, explain how a system works, then yeah, like I think it's very close to engineering because engineering is all about like engineering a system. Um, and also like writing forces you to kind of organize your ideas and your thoughts in a, um, in a way that's logical and engineering is very logical because if your writing is all over the place, um, no one's gonna read it and no one's gonna understand it. And, and same thing with code, right? Like it has to logically make sense. The, the sequence of, of code has to make sense. So I would say there's some analogy there, um, but I wouldn't say that, I don't know if like, there's probably really, really great engineers who are not good writers. Mm. Um, and, and the other thing I was gonna ask you was this like dichotomy between like Goldman Sachs to Coinbase, right? Like this company that is quite possibly one of the biggest in the world, yeah. um, you know, to a company that is like you said, uh, at the time, especially a startup. Um, what was that dichotomy like? Like that must've been like, you know, um, being in like Bizarro World or something, like trying to reconcile, I don't know, these two, at least for me, for these two universes, because they're, they're so different. Yeah, and that's a good question. I think like, you know, that my career track, my career track, yeah, career track kind of tells you that, uh, tells you kind of where my brain was at at different parts of my life. Um, and, you know, the more I look back at my career, it was just like, I was just interested in different things at different times. And I almost thought of my, the first decade of my career or first eight years of my career as like a startup where I was experimenting with different fields. And so, yeah, Goldman and Coinbase are like basically on two ends of the spectrum because Coinbase is technically competitive to Coin, uh, Goldman in, in, a, in, a, in a, not in like a Goldman versus Morgan Stanley way, but in a very like paradigm shift way. Um, so it was, it was completely different, but there, there were definitely some similarities. So one thing about number of top firms, whether it's Goldman, A16Z, Coinbase is obviously the people. So, um, because I worked at Goldman, A16Z and Coinbase, um, I understood what it meant to work with like high caliber people. So my bar for people right now is very high because I've worked with them. And I know how fast things can get done. I know how efficiently things can get done and you're not wasting time um, at these places, right? And there's something about that that like I, I get energized by because when you put a bunch of really efficient, smart, um, creative people together, something really magical happens. So that, that that's one thing that's very common, whether you're at Goldman or Coinbase. Um, and then the second thing with both firms was that they both were very good at sort of mentorship and training um, Goldman specifically, right? Like Goldman, I was an engineer and, you know, I, when I interviewed at Goldman, I literally, uh, true story, like I finished the interview and I, like, I, it was in downtown LA. I was where I was living at USC and I literally thought I bombed it. And I was like crying on the way home, walking back. Cause I was like, I put all my, like, I put like two months of studying into this. And I thought I wasn't going to get it. And I was like really upset. Um, and, but I ended up getting it. And it's because they saw that, uh, that even though I wasn't like maybe as good as like the ultra finance nerd, I had the engineering skill and the engineering ability to kind of piece things together and almost get there. And then they took that and what they take, so they, they hire people like me often, actually. They don't just hire finance people. They, some of my class included people that were philosophy majors mm -hmm. or psychology majors and stuff. And so they'll, they're willing to take people like us as long as they know that we can learn. And they put us through this like intense boot camp for two months before the first year starts. Um, it's Goldman training, it happens in New York. And they basically teach you everything from ground up. And um, same thing with Coinbase. Like, you know, I was a brand new engineer at Coinbase. I didn't really have experience at any, any other firm. Mm. Um, but my manager kind of took me under his wings and just kind of led me um, through the process of the first few months and made me feel not intimidated by it. And it was very like an open um, mentorship type of culture. If you had questions, you can ask, there's no dumb question. Um, so both firms were very similar in that regard. And I think like, if you work at like a really good company, you'll notice that like, um, regardless of whether a startup or a giant conglomerate or whatever, like internally, there's, there's almost like, there's a shared culture within the companies. 
Yeah, very interesting. And Preeti, you said that you were, I think you said that you were the second um, uh, like woman engineer, right? Uh, to start yeah. a, a uh, and what was that experience like? Cause like, again, and I know when I think back to my engineering experience, it was like 99 dudes, one girl, my wife, who's also an engineer, same thing for her. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I, I've got two little girls too, and, and you know, they love math and I'd love for them to someday explore engineering. But I sometimes think like, why is it that, that the world is kind of skewed? You know, in, in India, it's different by the way. I mean, I've been to Indian, I've seen inside Indian universities and it's like way more balanced, but, uh, but just curious, like, was, was that ever a challenge? Did you ever see that as a challenge or do you think people make that out to be a bigger thing than it is? I, uh... I didn't think it was a challenge. Um, I think people often ask me like, what does it feel like to be a, a woman in tech? And I generally don't like answering that question because mm -hmm. I didn't really, like it's not, I don't, I don't feel like I've gotten discriminated against just because I was female. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, like if anything, I was, um, I was helped along the way because they wanted more female engineers and it was almost like an advantage in some ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, and like, I think like as long as you bring the skills to the table, I didn't notice that there was much discrimination. And like mm. um, at Coinbase at the time, you know, I was a second engineer, but like, you know, I think when, when, when a female enters a science dominated field, we're used to just being surrounded by men. Um, that's just how it is, right? Like there's not that many female in engineering to start with. So I, mm. I was used to this ever since high school. Um, when I was in AP physics or when I was in engineering in college or when I was at like any of these um, engineering science oriented subjects, like you're mostly dumb, surrounded by males. So you kind of just get used to it. So when I entered tech in Silicon Valley, to me, it was nothing different. It was just like, it was just how it was. And um, I yeah, didn't I find it. Yeah. Sorry, I found it a bit surprising too. The recent article, the Popper and all these guys. I think Balaji, uh, you know, responded yeah. to them uh, nicely. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I always Not find it funny nicely. too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so fascinating. So your your story is is one that, like you said, you know, is uh, you've seen like the a wide spectrum of of the world, if you will, right? Um, and uh, and so I guess the next part, I, the next question I had was you, you said you were working on a project for the last few years, but more recently you decided to kind of like wrap up and now you're, I think you said free bird was the word you yeah. used. <laughs> yeah. So what does that look like? I'm curious, like, cause I did see you have a pinned tweet. You did allude to this course you're working on this crypto course, but you know, earlier this year I took a few months off and, and sometimes it's nice being a free bird. So but, but I'm just wondering, how is that, uh, how's that playing out for you? Yeah, I mean, like when I, uh, I don't think anyone expected 2020 to be what it was, mm. but originally it was just time for me to explore myself because, you know, ever since high school, I don't think I've really had free time. Um, I was always, always working. And so I think this was the first time in my life where I just was not working. And it was just like an opportunity to just explore my interests, my passions mm. and see where my brain and mind takes me. Um, so, you know, I started pursuing things like dance, which I've always wanted to try out cool. when I was young, mm. um, like a lot of physical stuff. Like I started getting a little bit more serious into like weight training, nice. um, really getting like trying to like learn about like diet and nutrition, which is something I've always kind of been interested in, but never really had the time to really go deep. Mm. Um, so it's honestly just been a year to kind of pursue my personal things, but um eventually i think crypto i uh crypto called me back i knew that like i <laughs> I, I took i honestly took a break from crypto for like for like five months and mm -hmm. i was like you know like i i i i it was time i was like i knew it was time to come back and the way i figured a good way to do that was to finally write this course that i've been like wanting to write for so long but just was having busy with work or whatnot and so, yeah, I committed to writing this, this course and it's going to take me probably another six, like at least six months to finish. So, oh, wow. Um, so this is going to be like one. a real, like a serious course, but it's going to be, I mean, I'm excited about it. You know, let me know how I, how we can help, you know, promote it and get the yeah, word yeah, out yeah. because there's always, yeah, you never get enough you know, education. Yeah. Uh, and I think everyone kind of comes at, everyone explains crypto differently. Mm -hmm. So I think like, you know, you can read um, a book by, you know, all the Bitcoin books out there, Andrew, Antonopoulos, whatever, like, and everyone will kind of have a different angle of explaining it. And mine is kind of another 
approach to explaining crypto and how I think it should be explained, um, especially Bitcoin and leading the events leading up to Bitcoin. Mm. So yeah, um, it's an email course. It actually it already started, and I, I usually just send one or two emails a week as I write it. I see. I, and is it like a queue? Like, is it okay? Anyways, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. And so people can find out about it. You're, it's 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 uh, pinned. It's pinned hey, down, Preeti, yeah. But before I keep moving forward, I want to be mindful of your time. How much more time do you have? Because you gave me a, your time, but I wasn't sure what the the time. Like twenty five minutes. Twenty five minutes. Okay, cool, cool. So we'll just keep moving forward. Um, you know, on that topic of um. Like you, you mentioned like food and nutrition. I, I know like I try and talk more about Bitcoin, but I also believe that like the only way to maintain your sanity in this space is to like work out and to eat healthy and to spend time with people you love. And you know what I mean? Like this, yeah. whether it's meditate or whatever it is, journal. Um, but, but, but do you have, um, you know, like a topic that I find is kind of like taboo. It's kind of like Bitcoin, you know, 10 years ago, more so, which was like this topic of anxiety. Um, I feel like almost everybody kind of silently deals with it, you know, um, yet almost nobody talks about it. And it's almost like this weird icky topic, but I, I do ask a lot of people about it. And it's like, I find like a lot of successful people tend to have little hacks, right? Things that they've figured out over the years that they use to kind of destroy, not destroy, right? I don't think you can ever get rid of it, but kind of deal with it. I'm just curious, is there, has there been, you alluded to things like exercise and whatnot, but do you have some sort of system, if you will? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the system, everyone's, the system, I think everyone should have a system and the mm. system could evolve because what different tools will, will work for you at different times in your life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think, yeah, you're right. Like anxiety, um, it's, it's just like energy that's kind of, everyone has it and how you kind of channel it is also very important. Mm. Um, yeah. So for me, I have like a morning, I'm a morning person. I'm a, um, 5 a.m. club the or... <laughs> uh, I, I have the most energy in the mornings usually mm. before like 3 p.m. So, mm. um, I usually do them all like my physical stuff in the morning. So I'll wake up, I'll kind of do my little cardio routine and then I'll go to the gym and actually lift weights. Um, so I, I channel a lot of my energy there and then throughout the day when I feel anxious, um, uh, the one thing that I've been really, I think a lot of people have been really doing this year is breathing and, and sort of meditating. Mm. I think that's really helpful. That's been helpful for me, specifically breathing. Um, one of the things I've been reading a lot about breathing and stuff. And I think I didn't realize that <laughs> when I'm stressed or when I'm anxious, I tend to breathe through my mouth. And um, that's actually really bad that it makes anxiety worse. Um, mm. And breathing, the importance of like breathing through your nose. And, and honestly, it just, it makes a huge difference. Um, I don't know why I have, I'm still reading about the physiology of like why that is, but um, yeah, breathing that's is been a, that's definitely been a huge fascinating. Thing. Fascinating. Yeah. Can I ask you what, like what, uh, like on the breathing? Cause I, 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 by the way, I, I have asthma. I've had it since I was a kid and I almost had like, uh, I'm not joking, like a near death experience. I don't know, like 10, 15 years ago where yeah. I was just like, okay, this is the end. And I kid you not in this like moment of like desperation, I somehow found this like YouTube video talking about, there's something called pranayam. I don't know if you've heard of that, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh my god like i to this day i do it every morning i like yeah. my parents do it every day like they're, they're like sunny our diabetes medicine we don't need to take it as much it's like it's amazing it's and, and difference. it is massive but curious what 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 is, like i mean there's wim hof and there's this yeah, there's, there's Wim that. Hof, but even there's a there's a really good book that i'm reading called breathe uh something uh it's by james nestor um mm. Let me pull up the name of the book, uh, but I would recommend everyone sort of read it. He has some YouTube channels about it as well. I think mm. the book is called, yeah, it's called Breathe. Um, Breathe, okay. And it's just an amazing book that kind of talks about, that explains the whole physiology of why it's so important to breathe from your nose and not your mouth hmm. and you know we have this ep epidemic of mouth breathers basically and that's leading to like an epidemic of sleep apnea and all kinds of downstream effects from that and so he he sleep apnea is a huge problem because your body basically heals itself when you're sleeping and if, you're, if people if majority of people are not sleeping properly then they're not healing each night which means mm -hmm. that they're they're everything gets fucked up during the day so hmm. it's just like 
every night you're supposed to reset your body, but that's not happening for a lot of people. And breathing is a huge part of that. So yeah, like the more I can, I mean, I can talk about this forever, but like, this is the rabbit hole that I've been really getting into myself because I think, I don't think we had a choice this year. We were all like left with no answers as to like what comes next. Um, mm -hmm. The future is very uncertain. And especially for people who are more logic brain or, um, you know, prefer some level of certainty, um, it's, it's kind of been tough. Um, and mm. so you have to find other ways to deal with it. And I think uh, breathing has been like, transformational. That is, uh, that's, that's music to my ears. I, I love that. Uh, I think uh, I totally agree. Um, uh, does the word presence mean anything? Um, I don't know. It's just like a conversation I was having with, having with a friend of mine this morning, and he was saying how one of his big big breakthroughs. He's like a pretty successful entrepreneur, and he said, you know, he just realized like he was always kind of living in the future or or the past, but always neglected kind of what was in front of him. But I'm just wondering, has breathing led you down that path as well, or um, is yeah? That I mean, it's something that I I try to do as well. I mean, I think entrepreneur minded people, at least what I've noticed is we do tend to live in the future mm. um, because that's what gives you hope, right? Like mm. you, you want to create a better future than what is today. And you want to like, you, you're always like aspiring to, to do something um, better and bigger and whatever. Um, and it, it puts you in like almost like a dreamlike state at times, but uh, that can also mean that you're kind of not present in the moment in conversations because you're just thinking about the future. So um I don't know. If, I don't know. If, I guess breathing and meditation could definitely help you with that. Um, I'm honestly very, still very new to meditation. It's only something I started in the couple, last couple of months. Um, and I'm sure it'll have like benefits down the road. But um, I, I also noticed that presence, like, I think this is also very common amongst, for some reason, techies. Um, mm. they, they, they lack this ability to um, be in the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it's most people though. I, I don't know if it's just isolated to techies. Like I, I, I rarely find people that can truly be present. Uh, but yeah, I think it's I think it's a gift that you can give your everyone can give themselves, and it's so easy, and it's so simple. Um, but but breath is is maybe the the key to that. Uh, but I I think, but I do think I, I agree with what you said though. I think having little systems in place to to hack anxiety and to kind of get yourself in the right mindset, especially given the context of everything that's going on is, is key. Um, hey, there's a couple of other, uh, okay, so one thing I wanted to ask, so my third question, so my third question was around, um, what is one truth that you hold that you, that most other Bitcoiners would disagree with you on? So what is one truth that you hold that most others in Bitcoin um, would disagree with you on? That's like mm. Peter Thiel's famous, like contrarian question or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I guess we have to define what we mean by Bitcoiners. Do we mean uh, Bitcoin maximalists or do we mean like rationalists? Because those are two very different camps. Interesting. Let's start with the former. Let's start with uh, Bitcoin maximalists. Maximalists. Um, I mean, like they all just think that alternative currencies like Ethereum and other coins are basically useless. And I would absolutely disagree with that. Um, I don't think the Quincy, the canonical cryptocurrency, I think there'll be many, many, many alternative currencies. Cool. Okay. And then about amongst the rationalists? Amongst the rationalists. Yeah. Like, um, I think most rationalists um, to this day believe that there's basically a 0% chance of Bitcoin failing. I would argue that it's a little higher. Um, I don't think we've crossed the, the, the chasm yet of reaching like certainty of the fact that Bitcoin is going to exist, like, you know, a hundred, a you know, hundred years from now, I think we still have a way to go to, to get there. I like those. I like that. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Uh, AI, uh, Preeti, this is another thing uh, that I'm not going to lie. I think a lot about, um, again, given your worldview and all the places you've worked at and whatnot, is this something that comes into your, I don't know, your radar? Is this something you think about? Do you think there's, uh, and by the way, let me just clarify one thing. So obviously I know there's like, like my Tesla drives itself, Google's AI, everything's AI, right? But not that. I'm talking about like general AI, this like more um, hokey sense that, you know, Elon Musk and all these guys are talking about, which is you know, computing, like evolving to the point where it's super cheap uh, to, to, to have 
you know, uh, artificial intelligence, general AI. Do you know what I'm getting at? Like the singularity, blah, blah, blah. Is that, is that something that uh, you've, I don't know, explored, thought about? Um, I've thought about it a little bit. Um, mm. I've, I've explored AI a little bit. I think I'm, I'm, I don't believe in, I don't believe that AI is going to ever learn like a lot of things that humans are good at, like, especially creativity. I think like we have barely touched the surface and understanding how the body works or the, how the mind works. Mm. Um, and for us to claim that somehow AI is going to over take humans is I think um, it's a far reach. Um, and so I, I do think AI, I think one of the things I am concerned about is ethical AI versus unethical AI. Um, and I think there's some firms and people and think tanks starting to think about this a little bit more because I mean, like if, even if you just take think about AI from like a, you know, social media, social network algorithmic point of view, even that AI is engineered to be biased and almost unethical mm. in a lot of ways, right? Mm. And so we have we can't make the same mistake when it comes to general AI where we, you know, incorporate all these biases and 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 things into AI. So I think like I really that is I'm I'm more scared about ethical versus unethical AI than about like AI taking over humans and destroying humans or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, the concept of like ethics, morality in AI is kind of like another maybe a topic for another conversation. Um, hey, Pini, where do people you know um kind of follow your 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 you know stream of thought if you will is it twitter is that where you mostly uh you know uh, participate and communicate and all that or is it do you have a website yeah. or yeah twitter um twitter I'm, I'm on and off twitter i'm not very consistent but that's where i'll share some stuff um but it's really my email list um i have an email list that i don't really promote that much but if you're a, a true follower then you're probably on it um that and yeah it's hosting cool. my email list on twitter Awesome. Awesome. And any, I don't know, uh, parting comments, word, wise words of wisdom. I mean, like I said, this has been uh, very fascinating and very interesting for me. So I really appreciate your time, but, uh, but anything else or should we bring this one to a close? No, that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for having me. All right, cool.